All right, welcome back. So this is gonna be a pretty interesting and fun lecture. We are going to derive the heat equation, one of the most important partial differential equations in all of science and engineering uh, for a generic 2D or 3D or even an n-dimensional volume V. So this is essentially, you can think of this as some uh, object, some mass uh, that is going to be you know, hot on one side, cold on the other, and we're going to derive the equations for how heat energy kind of flows through this volume uh, in, in time. And I'm gonna try at key locations in this lecture to tell you kind of, we're gonna make some simplifying assumptions, but I'm gonna try to tell you uh, at some places where those simplifications will break down and allow you to solve much more complicated physics. Okay, um, and this is kind of the culmination of, you know, us using vector calculus and Gauss's divergence theorem uh, and writing down physics as conservation laws. And this is going to be, you know, a really powerful set of equations. So, again, this all starts with a very simple, intuitive kind of gut feeling of what conservation of thermal energy looks like inside of this control volume. Uh, and I'll just tell you, this is called a control volume and this is this is a make-believe volume you get to choose the control volume i could have this control volume uh, here that i'm just defining with my hands this is an imaginary control volume we can analyze uh, or this control volume can be some piece of equipment you know it could be the uh, you know a bunch of metal pieces that are connected together and i could draw my control vol volume around those, those pieces and so the intuition of, that we're going to use to derive this partial differential equation is that the rate of change of heat energy inside that volume, so the rate of change um, of heat energy, of total heat energy in time, this is exactly what we wrote down for the 1D heat equation when we derived it. I'm just going to write it again. The rate of change of heat energy in time in V can only come from a few things. I can have heat flux through the boundary. I can have heat flux uh, out of the boundary, and I can have he, um, kind of radiation effects or heat generation effects inside. So I can have uh, heat energy flux, heat energy flux um, through the boundary of the volume, through the uh, boundary. We're going to call that S of our volume V. Okay, so I can have, um, and one way I sometimes think of this is that this control volume could be a zoom in. Maybe I've got some big, you know, block of metal. Okay, I've got some big block of, you know, tungsten or something that I'm working with. And I'm basically going to just zoom in to a little kind of, uh, a little patch of that and I'm going to be like kind of figuring out what is happening inside this little volume, what's happening when it transfers heat to its neighbors inside this larger volume. And what we're going to write down here is true for all volumes. I can move this volume around and this conservation is still going to be true. Okay? So I just this is just an imaginary volume and it could be a little piece of a larger, you know, wing or or object that you're analyzing or it could be the entire object itself. Okay, so we have that the total rate of change of heat energy in the volume and time can occur because of heat flux through the boundaries. Heat energy can leave uh, through the boundaries. And I can also have uh, plus kind of heat either generated uh, or lost inside the volume. Uh, so, for example, if this is an exotic material, like maybe this is, uh, has pieces of plutonium in it, it might be generating its own thermal energy at places, at points in space. Or maybe I hit this with a blowtorch at some point and I cause, you know, heat energy to be generated inside the volume. Technically, this is true even if there is a fluid flow, you know, even if I'm just drawing a control volume around a fluid flow, and that fluid flow is bringing in hot material and leaving out hot material. This is also true, um, this, this conservation is true, you know, in a gas turbine, in a jet engine. It's basically true that, that this is the only way you can have the rate of change of heat energy inside the volume. 
uh, and that heat flux through the boundary then would be convective. Some vector field would be carrying heat energy out uh, convectively. Today we're going to be talking mostly about conduction, where this is a piece of solid butted up against another piece of solid, and so it's conductively um, fluxing heat through its boundary. But, but again, we can relax all of these assumptions. So this is in words. Now we want to write this down in math, just like we did before. So again, um, the heat energy in a little voxel, a little delta V, is given by uh, C, I believe this is the specific heat, times rho, the density of the object, uh, times U of X and T. And I should probably have specified really way earlier that the thing I care about is U of X and T. This is the temperature temperature distribution. This is the variable that we are going to be solving for and writing our partial differential equation in terms of is the temperature distribution inside this volume. That's what the heat equation uh, is going to write down. And so uh, this, you know, times dV is going to be the amount of heat energy in some little, you know, delta V, some little delta V piece. And if we integrate this up over the entire volume, that gives us the total heat energy in this volume. This is just factual. It doesn't matter if there, this is a fluid flowing through the volume. This is still the amount of heat energy in that volume. Okay? C times rho times uh, the temperature integrated over the volume. And we're saying that the rate of change of this in time, ddt of this, and really I should be much more careful and say the partial derivative with respect to time of this quantity, because it depends on space and time, now is equal to the heat flux through the boundary plus any sources or sinks that are inside of that volume. Okay? Again, um, you know, crazy stuff could happen in here. I could have like a nuclear blast happening that's generating heat through you know, Einstein's E equals MC squared. And as long as my control volume is large enough, this is still going to be true. Okay? Okay. So the heat flux through the boundary, we are going to define, again, just like we did before, there is going to be some heat flux vector Q, where Q is going to be uh, the gradient, I believe the minus gradient of U. And now this is a vector, because this is a vector gradient. Uh, and this is essentially a statement of um, Fourier's law of heat conduction that the uh, heat flux, this has energy, units of energy, heat energy per time, is equal to the spatial derivative of the velocity, and uh, sorry, of the temperature. And so this temperature distribution and outside of it, outside of this volume, there are little Q vectors pointing in every which way. Every, you know, every point in space has a Q vector that is telling me where is the gradient of temperature, where is heat flowing from hot to cold. And at the boundary, if I have any Q dotted with the end direction, that means that there is heat flux uh, you know, leaving the volume. And so the way we write this down is we have our heat flux is going to be this Q uh, of X and T dotted into the normal direction, integrated up over the entire boundary and I'm making uh, this little surface symbol, we integrate the whole surface, the whole boundary of this domain, uh, and so for a 3D volume, this is a 2D surface integral, of the heat flux dotted in the normal direction. And to be consistent, I need this to be negative, because actually, um, heat flux goes from hot to cold, and just like in the 1D heat equation, uh, essentially if I have a positive heat flux, uh, if I have hot to cold to colder, then heat is fluxing in and I have a positive, uh, a, a positive rate of change of my thermal energy. And so because this is minus gradient of U, I need a minus sign out front. You can really just check for yourself uh, that the signs work out. I always spend about five minutes doing this with my class. Uh, to confirm that this negative sign belongs here and this negative sign belongs here. If you go back to my 1D heat equation derivation, I go carefully through why these signs are correct. Just take it uh, as a given that the way we define a heat flux vector Q means that 
if this quantity is negative, if I have negative heat flux out of the, out of the domain, then that negative heat flux times this negative uh, gives me a positive here. Sorry, I think that was a little confusing. A positive heat flux out of the boundary is a negative rate of change of heat energy inside the boundary. That's the easiest way to say it. If I have a positive heat flux dotted in the out of the boundary di direction, if I have a positive heat flux leaving <laughs> the domain, then this whole thing would be negative, which means that I am losing heat energy inside that volume. So if I'm fluxing out of heat energy out, I'm losing the total integral heat energy. And then finally, this last term is actually really easy. We just call this a function big Q of x and t. It's defined everywhere in the volume. And we just keep track of how much heat is being added or lost at every point in time. So at every point x, at every point time, I just do a little accounting, like do, is there some atomic process or some fission process or some you know, weird other process that's causing me to generate or lose heat inside of this volume. And this is one of the things I absolutely love about thermodynamics and about partial differential equations and about these conservation laws. This conservation law is true for relativistic systems. If, as long as you're keeping careful track of energy and mass, you know, things do add up to be conserved. Um, maybe you will have a rate of change of mass, but it's balanced by a rate of change of energy. Uh, for example, in this, you know, atomic bomb example. And so that's one of the things I really love uh, about this. Good, so we have a volume integral on the left, then a surface integral and a volume integral. And if you know me, you know that I wanna get these all under the same volume integral because then I can derive a partial differential equation out. So that's what I'm gonna do, is we're going to use Gauss's theorem here. So we're gonna essentially use uh, Gauss's divergence theorem, div theorem to turn this into a volume integral of the di divergence of this quantity inside, okay? And so I'm just gonna rewrite this. We have, um, and I'm trying to decide if I want to write this inside. I guess I'm gonna do it like this. So I have uh, DDT of my volume integral of C rho U of X and T dV equals, and now I'm going to use Gauss's divergence theorem, this becomes minus a volume integral of the divergence of Q of X and T integrated over my volume. So I've turned this into a uh, volume integral by the divergence theorem, the divergence of the heat flux, plus the triple volume integral of Q uh, X T dV. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Now we have everything under a volume integral, and what we can start doing is start moving everything to the left-hand side. I can bring my partial with respect to time inside, and C and rho are constant, so I can you know, pop them out and move my partial in. Uh, so I'll have partial U and all of this uh, on the right. So let's do that, uh, and maybe I'll switch colors here. So now what we end up having is a triple volume integral, triple volume, integral of C rho partial U partial T, partial U partial T, plus the divergence of my heat flux term, the divergence of my heat flux, minus any source terms Q, dV equals zero. So this is really, really powerful. We now have everything under one expression. And of course, we know that this heat flux Q is equal to minus grad U. And so uh, how do I want to write this? I think what I want to do is say, um, and there's probably some kappa here, some constant that I'm, I'm neglecting. So if I have the divergence of the gradient of a function U, we know, we've seen this so many times now, this is the Laplacian uh, of that function u. So I can swap this out with a minus, uh, a minus Laplacian, okay? So in fact, I'm just gonna do that. I'm gonna say um, this term here is minus Laplacian of u. 
And I'm going to use this uh, the next time I write this equation and I simplify. Instead of writing this, I'm just going to write minus Laplacian of u because we know that that's true. OK, now this is what I, I love, one of my favorite steps in deriving partial differential equations. This is super cool. We got everything onto a volume integral. Why did we want to do that? OK, this is totally fine. This is absolutely correct. This can handle all kinds of weird physics. Uh, why did we try to get everything under a volume integral? It's because as long as all of these quantities are continuously varying in space and time, so I can compute their derivatives, this is true for all volumes v. And the only way that this triple integral can equal 0 for all volumes v is if the stuff inside the triple integral equals 0 everywhere. Because I could shrink this volume down to a tiny little infinitesimal element, and this stuff inside still has to, has to add it up to equal 0. So because this is true for all volumes, I can write down that the stuff inside has to equal 0. And so essentially what I get is that um, you know, c rho partial u partial t equals del squared u plus q. Okay, like because everything here has to equal zero, so this has to be true. And I should just be careful here, there's a little uh, this is minus a kappa because there's a little kappa there. This is minus kappa. Okay, there's some, some uh, conduction rate. Some d d d the material has some uh, heat conduction constant. And so this is a little kappa. And this is the heat equation in ND. This is the n-dimensional heat equation, n-dimensional heat, uh, heat equation with, uh, with forcing. And so a couple things I want to point out here. This blue statement above is extremely general. This is true if I have a fluid flow carrying heat through a turbine. It's true if I have a nuclear bomb going off inside this control volume. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff can be happening. I can be burning rocket fuel. And as long as my control volume is large enough to include those effects so that I'm not um, kind of cutting off this nuclear bomb with my control volume, as long as it's a big enough control volume, uh, this is absolutely true, and the integral formulation would also be true. But here's the key simplification I added early. The heat energy flux through the boundary, I assumed that the only heat flux was purely conductive. This is, a, this is purely conductive uh, heat transfer. Now, if you had, and so that basically means we're talking about a solid object, a boulder or an I-beam or a wing, some solid object where there's no fluid flow moving mass around. This is conductive heat transfer. So this uh, Q dot N here means I am talking about a solid, uh, the heat equation in a solid. If I had a fluid flow and I wanted to keep track of the heat equation in a gas turbine engine, I would need to take how that vector field is fluxing material out. And I would probably, I guess, have something. I hope I don't botch this. Um, you know, if I, if I did have some vector field, some big flow field F carrying my fluid around, I guess I would have to take um, this mass times that fluid flow dotted in the n direction and integrate that through the surface. And I would get something when I did Gauss's theorem like the divergence of this vector field times C rho u um, you know, integrated over my volume, something like that. And this would essentially give me the energy equation for the fluid flow for the Navier-Stokes equations. If I have a thermal fluid flow, this could be written as the energy equation uh, that would complement uh, the, the Navier-Stokes momentum conservation equation. So I have mass conservation, momentum conservation, which is Navier-Stokes, and then I would have the energy conservation of how energy, uh, heat energy is being carried through that fluid flow. But again, here, because I'm dealing with this Q dot N, we're only uh, limiting ourselves to conductive heat transfer. Now, I could have radiative heat transfer if I wanted with uh, the sourcing term also. I could have you know, this thing radiating energy. Kind of the sky's the limit. You can, as long as you can imagine the physics and you're careful about keeping track of everything using accounting, 
this basic procedure is going to work for deriving your partial differential equation. And it can get a lot gnarlier. I mean, this term is always going to be a surface integral through the boundary of the flux. And you're always going to use Gauss's theorem, uh, sometimes Stokes's theorem, but usually Gauss's theorem to turn this into a volume integral. And if you can argue that you're, you're not near any shock waves or discontinuities, again, this, this atomic bond probably is a discontinuity, but if you can argue that the, your, your fields F and U are varying smoothly in space and time, then this has to be true for all volumes, and you arrive at your partial differential equation. So I just love uh, PDEs because when I learned how to, <laughs> how to do this, and I didn't learn about this until... Uh, you know, when I was a graduate student. So, you know, I, it was a while, it took me a while to learn about partial differential equations, but it really is incredibly powerful. You can take some basic fact of nature, mass is conserved, energy is conserved, momentum is conserved, and you can write it down in words as an accounting problem. This is just what has to happen. The only way heat energy inside a volume can change is if heat fluxes through the boundary or if there's sources or sinks inside the volume. Uh, and then using vector calculus and Gauss's theorem, you can arrive uh, at your equations of motion. Okay, is there anything else I want to show you? Um, I guess in the absence of this Q term, if there's no external forcing, if we just take a simple object like a hot piece of material, but it's not you know, doing fission and I'm not hitting it with a blowtorch, then I can kind of divide by C rho and kill this Q term, and I get partial U partial T equals some positive constant times del squared u. So this is the heat equation that you're often used to seeing. This is kind of the simple form of the heat equation uh, when there's you know, nothing fancy going on. So in 2D, uh, in 2D, this becomes u sub t equals alpha squared uh, uxx plus uyy. I just want to remind you that the Laplacian operator in 2D is just the second partial with respect to x plus the second partial with respect to y. Uh, in 3D, this would be ut equals alpha squared uh, uxx plus uyy plus uzz or zz, depending on where you're from. And of course, you can do this in n dimensions, where now it's a sum of all n partial derivatives with respect to the, the spatial variables. Uh, okay, last thing I want to tell you, this is already getting to be pretty heavy. This is the heat equation. And again, it, depending on my, I need initial conditions and boundary conditions to actually solve uh, for the distribution in space and time. I need to know what my initial temperature was and what my final, uh, what, what my boundary conditions are. Kind of what, what is the boundary of this, this object that determines this heat flux through the boundary. Uh, and if I look at the infinite time limit or the steady state limit where the temperature distribution no longer changes, where it has reached an equilibrium. So in the equilibrium, uh, or steady state limit, we recover Laplace's equation. So these UTs equal zero. And I essentially have, you know, UXX uh, plus UYY equals zero. Or in this case, I have UXX plus UYY plus UZZ equals zero. And in general, I just have that the Laplacian of U uh, equals zero. So Laplace's equation for the steady state or equilibrium temperature distribution. Okay, that was a lot. I hope that you have taken away kind of the core message that vector calculus is the language by which we encode physical conservation laws. We encode physical conservation, like mass, momentum, energy, heat energy, using these vector calculus, uh, tools from vector calculus, triple integrals, you know, surface integrals, uh, and things like Gauss's theorem allow us to convert our surface integrals to volume integrals, which allow us to get everything under a common integral. And if that is true over all volumes, it allows us to derive a partial differential equation. And these partial differential equations are the language for how we describe how objects we care about change in space and time. Okay? Powerful stuff. Thank you.